I'm Dr. Cooper Williams. I'm here at the Jekyll Center in Thompson Station, Tennessee, and I'm here to present the pelvic ultrasound of the horse, both inside and out. Moving on to the transrectal portion of the pelvic survey, we're going to start with the pelvic floor. We're going to start there by looking at the obturator foramen. If you look at the pelvic specimen, I have my probe positioned over the obturator foramen, and on the screen, that's the appearance of looking through the obturator foramen. You don't have any bone reflection. And then as I move back, you're going to see the ischium table, the cranial aspect. My probe position is here on the specimen. And if you look on the screen, I can freeze this image and move our arrow up. This is the cranial aspect of the ischium table here, and curving down into the obturator foramen. I'm going to continue on the ischium table to the caudal aspect, and on the pelvic specimen that will be just simply sliding from the cranial edge here back to the caudal edge here. I'll unfreeze my image here, and you can see as I move back from the cranial edge, I just look for this nice white contiguous portion of bone. If you have a fracture, it's either going to be contiguous or it's not. There's no secret to it. You can see as it dives off the caudal edge here, so again, transferring forward. So what I will do now is we'll freeze one image and we'll go to the other side of the screen and I usually do each half on each side of the screen. So I'll have right on the right side of the screen, left on the left side of the screen, and that's the image that we have here on the screen. And again, I'll freeze that and you can see as I move my arrow up, the cranial edge as it goes into the obturator foramen. So we'll unfreeze this side and again, go back to the caudal edge of the ischium table. We'll freeze that, and we'll update here, flip over to the other side, and you can see again the opposite side. And this horse actually has, it looks like a little bit of an alteration in shape of the ischial table. He may have had some past trauma, and this same patient had the asymmetry to the ischium tuberosity. And so that may explain why this is a slightly different shape than this nice smooth curve here. So again, on the specimen, looking at the cranial edge, sliding back to the caudal edge, and doing that both sides like this. We'll move from the ischium table to the ischium neck. So on our specimen here, as I slide from the ischium table, I'm going to move my transducer up to this, what looks like a little bit of a long bone between the ischium table and the acetabulum. And so my probe position will be here, and I'll slide around, and you can't see that from here, but doing the other side as well. And if you look on the screen, I'm going to slide from the ischium table up to where we get a nice curved edge for the ischium neck, and that's this. I'm going to again update my image, and we'll do the opposite one. So here again, using our arrow, we can see this entire ischium neck in cross-section on both sides. Again, right on the right, left on the left. And then moving forward from there, we're going to do the, the inner portion of the acetabulum. And you have landmarks here that are vessels. You have the obturator vessels that form these circles here and here. They're the obturator artery and vein. And you get a W shape to the acetabulum. So if I do that on the specimen, Again, you can see here as I move my transducer up, this is the back side of the acetabulum. You can't see into the hip joint, but you can see the acetabulum from the back. And you can see these channels in the bone here. That's where these channels are for the vessels. So again, I'll update our image. We'll flip over to the other side. We go from, again, the ischium neck to the acetabulum. And you can match those images up here and you can see that they're good mirror images of each other. This is the, where the channels are in the groove of the back of the acetabulum. You can see that on each side. Then from this portion, we're going to move forward to the pubic bone. And on our, our pelvic specimen here, you're on the acetabulum. All you need to do is slide your hand down. And this is a good for the mind's eye where we're looking at this specimen. It allows you to see from acetabulum simply sweeping down to the pubic bone. And that's at the cranial edge of the obturator foramen, which is here. So again, on the image, so we're going to go from acetabulum, which is here, 
and to sweep down to get the pubic bone, which is here in cross section. So I come back. So pubic bone here. And this is going to vary from horse to horse in its shape. We'll flip to the other side and do a duplicate image over there, hopefully. And again, you have this. Sometimes it has more of a curve to it, but again, just you're just looking at bone surfaces. Ultrasound, again, is the most sensitive tool for bone surface detail. You're just looking for a contiguous bone surface here on the right and then here on the left. So you can also, instead of just going for that one perfect image, you can go ahead off of dual for a second and just sweep the whole pubic edge to make sure that you're not missing anything. And then you can also go down the midline, which is the symphysis between the two halves, the two hemipelvises, and that's going to be here on our specimen right on the midline. And sometimes you have uh, unossified bone. It would still have some cartilage remnants that would be visible as a little bit of a roughened portion along this, but now I'm just traveling literally back through the whole symphyseal region. Here you can see the, the appearance of the cartilage between the two hemipelvises. If I sweep off, you can again see bone. If I go on the midline, you can see the cartilage. Going forward, it's totally ossified in the pubic range. So the final thing I'm going to do on the pelvic floor is going to be looking at the cranial edge of the pubic bone here, and I'm going to match that up with muscle attachments that are there. So we'll go ahead back to a dual screen, and we'll do left on the left again. But here, you can see the two main muscles, and I'll freeze both images first before we point to what we're looking at. But you can see on this screen, we'll use our arrow again. This is the cranial edge of the pubic bone here and here on the right and on the left. And this arch here, this line of the fascial plane of the rectus abdominis muscle, that's the main muscle attachment to the pelvic brim. And that muscle is responsible for propulsion as well, you know, along with other muscles of the horse. But I always look at this. The one thing, again, that I want to explain is that you want to be methodical and you want to go through a survey. So whether you use my method or whether you use your own method, go through each one of these structures in a methodical way so that you don't miss anything. It's very important to do that. And again, these muscle attachments are part of the whole thing. I've had injuries to these, and you don't want to miss those. The only way to make sure that you see these, if there's a problem, is to look each time. You can sweep through this entire examination very quickly. So again, this is the final portion. So you have the rectus abdominis on each side, and this little white attachment in here is the pectineus muscle that sits inside of the rectus abdominis. These are the intheses or attachment points for the pectineus muscles. And you can also see if there's any problem with those. So that completes the pelvic floor examination. And we're going to move to the pelvic roof. Slide number one demonstrates the normal transrectal pelvic floor anatomy. The anatomical specimen is on the left-hand side of this slide, and you can see the, the appearance of the ischial table and of the median symphysis. This is only demonstrating a hemipelvis, one half, the left-hand side. But you can see, again, the normal reference of the ischial table anatomically. And then on ultrasound, the bottom ultrasound images show both the cranial and caudal aspects of the right and left hand sides of the ischial table. These are normal reference images and show the curve of bone as they go over the brim of that particular structure, both cranially and caudally. Slide number two demonstrates again the normal anatomical appearance of the hemipelvis of the ischial table. The two ultrasound images demonstrate different ischial table fractures. The left hand image shows a normal contiguous section of bone of the ischial table on the left hand side and on the right hand side the lack of continuity of the bone surface because of the fracture of this particular structure. The right hand ultrasound image at the bottom on the right hand side shows normal contiguous ischial table bone, just the white line. 
contiguous, and the left-hand side of this image demonstrates several fracture fragments and a total lack of continuity of the bone surface. Slide number three shows a pelvic floor mass with the associated osteolysis. You can see the normal reference images of the cranial aspect of the ischial table in the upper left-hand side, ultrasound, and then you can see the osteolysis of the normal bone surface along with an associated mass on the pelvic floor right at the cranial brim. The mass is demonstrated in a photograph at the bottom right hand side of this particular slide and an ultrasound of that mass above. Slide number four demonstrates fractures of the ischial neck. There are normal reference images of the ischial neck the top left hand side, just a curved section of bone. The central image shows a normal reference image on the left, but fracture fragmentation on the right ischial neck. And the most right hand image, again, shows a normal reference image of the ischial neck on the left hand side, but significant fracture fragmentation of the ischial neck, along with a hematoma, because of how acute this particular fracture was, this was caught at the time of the hematoma being associated with the fracture fragments. Slide number five shows normal acetabular anatomy along with reference images of the ultrasound appearance of the acetabulum. So the two ultrasound images show a normal reference on the right hand side of each of those images. Has a normal sort of a W shape appearance with the obturator artery and vein right against the bone, giving the absolute anatomical location when you see this appearance. The left hand side of both of those ultrasound images show two different horses with different fractures of the acetabulum, making the normal anatomy unrecognizable. You can actually see in the left hand image a spear like shape to one of the bone fragments and you can see hematoma associated with these fractures and the inability to recognize the normal obturator vessels in this region. Slide number six shows the normal anatomical appearance of the pubic bone, which is the, the most cranial aspect of the pelvis, forward of the obturator foramen, and then the normal reference images on ultrasound appearance at the very top. You can see just normal contiguous bone in a nice concave appearance. You can see a normal reference image on the bottom left ultrasound, the right hand side of that particular image, and then again a spear-like shape of bone, fracture fragment that's sticking straight up instead of being horizontal the way it should be on the image. And the bottom right hand image shows just one half of pubis with significant fracture fragmentation demonstrating a total lack of continuity of the bone surface. Slide number seven shows a normal ultrasound appearance of the muscle attachments at the pelvic or pubic brim. You can see the rectus abdominis as it arches off the cranial aspect of the pubis and the attachment or enthesis of the pectineus muscle as well. The bladder neck is visible at the very top portion of each of these images but this is a good normal reference image for these muscle attachments at the pubic brim. Slide number eight shows again the normal reference image but on the left hand side of this slide and then significant muscle disruption of the rectus abdominis as it inserts on the pubic brim and some disruption of the bone surface as well. There's significant enlargement of these attachments as well as significant muscle fiber tearing.